Good morning, everybody. Let's stand together and worship this morning. Good morning. It's better. I thought you were asleep for a second.
with him, you could have sang right on with us. You just have to just make out like you were meant to do it. Well, you guys can tell I've never heard that song before this moment. <laughs> Be seated. My name's Tim. I'm, I'm obviously new here. This may, may not be my last mistake that I make, but glad you guys are here. I had an epiphany this week, and uh, I think it's a way for Jeff Bezos to make more money. Not that he needs any, but um, I think you know, we've had a few Amazon deliveries because we moved in a new house, and there were some things we needed, and so, uh, you know, a couple times a week, we get an Amazon truck, and Cindy just gets excited, you know? And I said, the Amazon truck is the ice cream truck for adults. <laughs> Amen. Can I get an uh-huh? Uh-huh. Everybody's excited when they see that Amazon truck pull up. It needs music. It needs like an ice cream truck music. And it would be like a Pavlov's dog re- response when the adults hear it. They're like, I need something. You know what I'm saying? I don't know why no one's thought of this until now. Thank you, Landon. Land's the only one that loves me in this whole place, but I appreciate that. We're glad you guys are here today. It's going to be a great day in the Lord's house, worshiping him. And I pray that uh, God has already spoken to you today, and he will continue to do so. We're going to ask a couple things from you. If you're new, we want to ask you to fill out a Connect card in the seat back in front of you. And uh, we'd love to be able to introduce, introduce ourselves to you and share what God's doing here at Central. You can drop them in the offering boxes, or you can meet me at the back at the Connect table. I've got a gift bag for just for you. I'd like to introduce myself to you and uh, share some things with you as well. So if you'd meet me back there right after the service, I'd be delighted uh, to have that happen. Uh, That's number one. Number two, we've got some quick announcements for you. Number one is coming up August the 11th is our main event activity uh, for our first through fourth grades. Is it, I'm sorry, August the 7th. You're right. First through fourth grade. That's my second mistake since I've been here. Number two. We may make it three in the same hour. Who knows? Um, But first through fourth, boys and girls, August the 7th. And uh, we'd love to have you guys there. Cost is $12. And you can see me back at the Connect table. And I can help you with getting signed up and that kind of stuff as well. Okay? Number two, Promotion Sunday is August the 15th. August 15th. a lot of you guys, school-age kids, you're going to be going up to a new grade. We're going to be going up to a new grade here as well, more than likely. So for Promotion Sunday, we, we make it a big deal, and we've got a snow cone truck coming. I, I like to see Sam. We have one charismatic here. Grateful to see that. Um, but it's just one, Sam. It's Please keep it to one. And uh, No, not two hands. That's right. Uh, that's August the 15th, free snow cones. And I also want to say the last one, thank you guys so much for your continued faithfulness to Jesus with your giving and your faithfulness in attendance, your faithfulness online. We're grateful to be able to minister to you in any way that we can and continue to all of us to be pruned into the image of Jesus Christ. All right, let's pray together this morning. Jesus, we love you. We're thankful for your grace in our lives. It is so needed. We need your mercy that's new every morning. And I I ask, God, that your spirit would be in this place, that uh, you would move in our hearts, that we would not leave the same as we came in, God, that we would be changed and transformed in the image of our Savior, Jesus. It's in his name we pray all these things. Amen. Let's continue to worship. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. He's working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley.
great this morning. You may be seated. It's great to see you all here today. I'm so happy that you've come to worship this morning. If you have your Bibles or your Bible on a device, I would invite you to get ready. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 9 in just a few moments. And uh, just to Miss Alex, we're going to start at verse 35 instead of verse 36. So I'm going to go ahead and add that one in there. But while you're turning there, uh, I just want to mention one more thing that is coming up. Uh, September the 19th, we are going to start something called... Discover Central. Who is this for? If you've joined the church, let's say in the last year, and you're like, you know what, there's some things that I still don't know about my fellowship here that I would love to know, you're invited to come to Discover Central. We would love for you to come. It's going to be on a Sunday afternoon from 4 to 6 p.m. It's going to be two hours. In that two hours, you're going to learn a lot of things about the church, a lot of things about the ministries of the church, and you're also going to be fed a meal. And uh, so, it's for those of you who've joined in the last year and say, you know what, I just would like some more information. It's for those of you who've been attending Central and are thinking, you know, maybe this would be the place that the Lord would have for me to uh, find my community, my family, my church family, and be a part of something bigger than myself and helping this church to minister to this community. We would love for you to come. You're under no obligation whatsoever, but we would like to share with you what God is doing in this fellowship and what we believe uh, his plans for us are and how we're going to move forward together to accomplish the mission that God has set us on. So uh, if you've recently joined, you're, you're not a member, but you've been attending and would like to come, maybe today's your first time. You're thinking, you know what, that'd be a great way to get to know more about this church. You are invited. So we're still a good ways out, but as we get closer, we'll have a sign-up sheet a way for you to either go on our website or sign up here, but a way for you to let us know you're coming so we can make sure we have food for you and uh, would love for you to come. If you have kids, bring your kids. We'll have something for them to do as well. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And uh, if you have things that you're scheduling, pencil out September the 19th from 4 to 6 p.m. We would love to have you come and be a part of that day. In Matthew chapter 9, let's stand together. I want to... Uh, talk to you today on the subject of being soul conscious, soul conscious, because I believe that as Christians, that is our number one calling from God. Let me say that again, because I only got one believer right now, Brother Joe, thank you. I believe as Christians, our number one calling is to be soul conscious conscious. And let me just say at the outset, there are so many things, like I said last week, distractions, 
Uh, we could add another D word to that. There's so many things that the devil's using not to only distract us, but to divide us. I'm going to say to you this morning, I don't care. It's not about Republican or Democrat or Independent or anything else that's out there. It's not about the color of your skin. It's not about the language that you speak. Every single human being that you lay eyes upon has a soul, and God wants us, his church, to be conscious of that fact and concerned for them for that fact. Because I'm telling you, church, I believe we're living in the last days. I believe this I know. You're going to say, man, you're brilliant. Every day that we live, we're one day closer to the return of Christ. But I do passionately believe that it could be in my lifetime. And... And so that being said, I'm, I mean, I'm older than a lot of you, but I'm, there's some of you older than me. Let's just put it this way. If it's in my lifetime, I don't care how old you are in here, you're close to it too. And we need to be concerned about fulfilling the mission that God has set us on. And he wants us to be concerned for the souls of mankind because they're going to spend an eternity somewhere. There's only two choices. There is no in-between. It's heaven or it's hell. Some people have told me before, well, I believe in heaven, I just don't believe in hell. Well, you can't have one without the other. Listen to Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. In the second half of this little passage, Jesus speaks directly to us, his followers. It says, and Jesus went about all the cities and the villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But watch this. This is Jesus. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. If you have a pen, I want you to underline that one phrase in your Bible. When he saw the multitudes, when he saw the crowds, when he saw the people, he was moved with compassion on them, and then he tells us why. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, and let me just call time out real quick, that's you and that's me. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've asked Jesus Christ into your heart, you've repented of your sins, and today you call yourself a Christian because of your faith in Jesus, that's the only way you're a Christian, is if you have faith in Jesus. Being a member of Central Baptist or any other church will not make you a Christian. That just makes you a church member. But if you're a Christian, you're born again, you're saved, Jesus is talking to you, and this is what he said. The harvest truly is plenteous. It's plentiful. There's a lot of souls out there to be harvested. But Jesus said the problem, the issue is the laborers are few. And he said, pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm humbled, Lord, at the privilege that I have this morning to stand here and speak your word. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would move in this service. I thank you and praise you, God, for every person that you've brought here in person, every person who may be watching through the live stream. I believe, Lord, that your Holy Spirit has brought us together this morning with a specific and clear purpose. And I pray, God, that your purpose would be fulfilled. And, I, and Lord, we'll praise you and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I love, I love the Bible. If you love the word of God, say amen. amen. That's easier said than lived out. Right? I mean... We love God's word, but what did Jesus say? Jesus said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. If we love him, if we love his word, what he expects of us is for us to find out what his commandments are and then for us to put them to practice in our lives. The word of God is the most amazing word ever written. It's the only word that is what is known as a living word. You say, well, I don't really know what that means. Well, number one, it's a living word because its author is God. And he's the God and the, the father of all living. He's the creator of all things. 
He knows everything. He sees everything. He hears everything. He is all-powerful, all-knowing. He is omnipresent. He can be all places at the same time. He is the creator of heaven and earth. And I want you to know this morning that the word of God is a word, a message that is, that is full of hope. It is full of life. It, it is full of peace and comfort and wisdom and guidance and mercy. And perhaps most importantly, the word of God is a message that is full of grace and forgiveness. Now, you'll notice every single one of those words that I just told you that God's word is full of, we love every one of those words, especially how they relate to us. Right? I mean, we love mercy. When you've messed up, don't you like mercy? Y'all wake up. When you've done nothing to deserve something good called grace, don't you love God's grace? We didn't earn it. Don't you love hope? Don't you love peace, guidance, protection? We love all of those things. The word of God, the point is this, is a, is a word from God to us that is filled with blessing and hope and promise. But there are some passages in God's word that can disturb our hearts. I want to read one of those to you right now. It's found in the 142nd Psalm, verse 4. We read these words. No man cared for my soul. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a very disturbing passage to me. Let me tell you why I find that so disturbing. It's because in 2000, this was written thousands of years ago. But in 2021, you see, it's a living word, so it's just as relevant today as it was the day that it was written. You believe that this morning? The word of God is just as relevant today as it was the day that it was written. The psalmist cried out, no man cared for my soul. What's so disturbing and frightening about that to me is that there are literally millions upon millions of people living today in our world who are echoing that exact same sentiment. And let me tell you what's even more disturbing than the fact that that's what so many people in our world today are crying out. What's more disturbing is that many of them are correct in the way that they feel. I believe that it's safe to say that there are millions and millions of people who have no one to pray for them by name. Now, we can say, and I've done it, we can say, well, I pray for the lost of the world. I'll, dear God, be with all the lost people. May they come to know you. And, and I'm not saying that's a bad prayer to pray. We should pray that prayer. But I'm telling you, if you know lost people by name, you ought to be taking their name before the throne of God praying specifically for specific individuals to come to know the truth of God's word. We, as the church, need to do as Jesus said, and we need to pray for those who are lost. I'm just telling you this morning, there are millions and millions of Christians in our world today. They have been saved. They've experienced the grace and the amazing forgiveness of God. They are on their way to an eternity in heaven. They have been set free from the bondage and the slavery of their sin. They've experienced the incredible, undescribable love and forgiveness of God. They've had a new and a fresh start in life. But sadly, there are many Christians who are simply content with their own salvation. You say, I don't quite get what you mean. In other words, they're just happy to know they're on their way to heaven, and the truth be known, they don't really care if anyone else goes with them or not. They're just happy they're going. Now, we would never, being let's be honest, being the spiritual people we are, being what we do know about God's word and what the great uh, commission tells us to do, none of us would ever verbally say, I'm going to heaven and I don't care if anyone else does or not. We would not say that. We say we care, but the, but the proof of our concern is in the action that we take. I don't think there's one Christian here this morning or watching online who would say, 
I don't think that we as Christians have this responsibility because God's word is clear. I think every person who's within the hearing sound of my voice this morning who is a Christian would give testimony to the fact that they believe as Christians we are called to be Christ-like. You can amen there. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, a person who is living their life with an effort to be Christ-like. As believers, we've been given his name. That's why we're called Christian. We've been given the name of Christ, and as his children, we need to represent him. Thank you. Our life, church, wake up, should shout Christ. When people see you out tomorrow, whether it's at work or in the grocery store or wherever it is, when they see you, they ought to know there's something different about that individual. Not everyone's going to know what it is. Some people might. I've literally had people that I just got into a small kind of surface conversation with before, right off, just come out and say, are you a Christian? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, I could just sense it in your spirit. Sometimes they do know, but some people will know there's something different, but they will not know what it is. Our text today tells us that Jesus, when he saw the multitudes, this is what we need to hear this morning, he was moved with compassion. It does not say that Jesus had compassion. Read the verse. I don't care what translation you're reading from. It's not that he had compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion. I'm sure that we would all say this morning that we have compassion for the lost, but can we truly say that our compassion has moved us into action? You see, true passion, when you're truly passionate about something, it will always motivate you to take action. I can remember, I'm going to pick on him a little bit. Years ago, I was friends with a guy, still am, who loved the Dallas Cowboys. He loved them so much that in the hot Summer months, Landon, he would travel to wherever they were practicing and go watch them practice. They're not even playing a game. In fact, he took me with them once. Remember that? I went with you once, Tim. He was passionate. He's probably not as passionate today. It's been a few years since they won a Super Bowl. Oh, no, I'm in trouble now. I'll come tomorrow. But listen, it's okay to be passionate about your favorite team. But he was so passionate that he was willing to go sit in the heat and watch these guys, some of them who we had no idea who they were because they weren't yet a Dallas Cowboy. Go watch them practice and see. That was called being passionate about his team. It's okay. Some of us are passionate about golf. Some of us are passionate about our children. And, and let me just say, you should be. You see, what I want you to see is this. Having passion about something will cause you to take action. Luke 19.10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man is come, and he came for this reason, to seek and to save that which was lost. Mark 10.45, the words of Jesus. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Can you hear the passion in Jesus' words as he speaks of the reason for which he came? The, his passion for lost men and women is what propelled him to the cross of Calvary where he gave his life so that he could save lost sinners like you and like me. Romans 5, 8 says, but God commended, God demonstrated, God showed, God proved his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. 1 John 2, 2 says that he is the propitiation. What does that word mean? It means that he is the payment. He took our place. And he became our sin. He is the propitiation for our sin. But listen to this. Not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Man is without excuse before God. Every single human being, if the Bible is true, and I believe that it is, it says it is appointed unto men once to die, and after death, the judgment. Every single human being is going to stand before God and give an account of his life. And the account is not going to be how many times did you go to church? How much money did you give to the church? How many people did you personally evangelize and lead to Christ? 
Not how many times did you work and teach a Sunday school class. Not how many times did you sing in the choir. Not how often did you pray and read the Bible. The question is going to be, what did you do with Jesus Christ? And that's the message that we, the church, have been given to take to the world. Now, we complicate it. We say, well, I need more training. Let me just say to that, if you've met Jesus, that he's done something in your life, and you don't need to be trained how to tell people about that. Kyle, I can prove it. You and I both like to fish, right? You let me discover a new lure that catches more fish than that old tiny torpedo, a better top water, one that the bass respond better to. Guess what? I don't need training. Kurt, I don't need training how to tell someone how much better that lure is. Guess what? I just start spreading it, but not to everybody. If I'm going to be in a contest against you, you're not going to hear about it. Right? Isn't that the way we are? If we believe in something and we know something works, we tell people about it. I know why it's quiet. Because you get the parallel. We believe in Jesus. We know that a relationship with Jesus Christ has worked for us. Then why are we not speaking it passionately? As we look at this passage together this morning, I want us to consider the thought soul conscious. My first prayer is this, is that if you're hearing this message, you're in this building or you're watching online, and this is my biggest prayer this morning, if you're hearing this message and you've never given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ, my prayer today above all else is that today would be the day of your salvation, that you would open your heart to Jesus Christ and say, I repent of my sins and invite you into my heart and into my life. That's my first and highest priority prayer this morning. My second prayer is somewhat like it. And that would be as if you have come to the place where you've received Jesus Christ as personal Savior. My prayer for you and for me is that we would truly get passionate about the needs of this world to hear about Jesus and that we would be moved. Did you hear me? That we would be moved with compassion. Jesus points out four things. We see four things in this text. First of all, Jesus saw that they had turned their back. When he, why was he moved when he saw the people? Because he saw that they had turned their back on God. Verse 36, but when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Listen carefully, because the next phrase tells us why he was moved. Because they fainted, and they were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. I want you to notice that little phrase, they were, they were scattered. Jesus saw that the people were outside of the fold of God. They, they were outside of the family of God. They, they were not a part of the family. They had no companionship. They had no fellowship. They were living a shallow life, a shallow existence. Their existence, like many people today, while it has a lot of earthly meaning, I mean, it would be difficult for me today to stand before some of the wealthier people of our world and say to them, you have a very shallow existence. They would probably laugh at me in my face. But I'm telling you, if I knew for sure that they didn't know Jesus, I could say that with absolute assurity. Because Jesus said, if you gain the wealth of the whole world and lose your own soul, you have nothing. So while they may have a lot of earthly meaning, their life, many people's lives, back then the ones Jesus was looking at and the people that we look at every day, there are many people in our world who have no eternal hope. They're simply living for the here and now. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, the here and now is very, very temporary. I've attended two funerals just this past week, two different gravesides. One was 84, one was 91. You're like, well, man, they lived pretty long. Yeah, they did, but in the grand scheme of things, when you compare 84 or 91 to eternity, it's just a drop in the bucket. Makes that verse ever so true that our life is like a vapor. It appears for a short time, and then it vanishes away. Not only were these people that Jesus was speaking of out of the family of God, they were also away from the shepherd, which means they had no real guidance. They were wandering like lost sheep, and they had no protection. And I'm telling you this morning that sheep without a shepherd will always end up 
in trouble. Throughout the Word of God, Jesus repeatedly compares us to sheep. And I'm telling you, Jesus makes it clear that sheep need a shepherd. And just as sheep need the guidance and the protection of a shepherd, Jesus was speaking literally of sheep, you know, bah, those sheep. He compares us to sheep. And I'm telling you this morning, this might offend somebody, but we need the protection of the good shepherd. As Christians, Jesus is our shepherd. John 10, verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus saw these people. He saw that they were away from home. He saw that they had no comfort. They had no rest. They'd grown weary. They were living in a weary, weak, and vulnerable state. Jesus saw that they were apart from where they should have been. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12 says, at that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Church, sheep do not do well on their own. In fact, I will tell you, you turn a sheep out to pasture by, by itself, and it will not be long before the predators get the best of it. We as sheep need a shepherd, and Jesus is the good shepherd. We Christians need to understand that this world is far from God. I mean, have you looked around lately? Folks, this world is far from God. Sadly, there are many, many churches today who are far from God. And I'll just state, the reason I believe for that is while they may have started good, a lot of churches, what they've done, rather than keeping their eyes on God, making sure to maintain the right distance and closeness to God, rather they've just looked at the world and made sure they kept a safe distance from the world, all the while the world's moving further and further and further away from God, and so goes some churches and some Christians. Guys, our focus should not be where's the world. Our focus should be on God. That's where our attention needs to be. When, when Jesus looked at the multitudes, he saw their departure from God. He saw that they had turned their back on God. Secondly, he also saw that their lost, he saw their lost condition. He saw that they were slaves to their own sin. And sadly, they didn't even know it themselves. Jesus said they, he used this word, he said they fainted. Listen, he wasn't referring to physical fainting. They weren't like dropping out because they were hungry. Jesus was referring to something much deeper, much, much more profound, much more important. You see, Jesus could see their heart. He knew what was going on on the inside. He could see their spiritual condition. And when he saw them, and he saw that they were fainting spiritually because they had no shepherd, he was moved with compassion on them because they were a people who were lost. And they were buried underneath the burdensome load of their own sin. Ephesians 2.1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. A lot of times we as Christians think that we take the gospel to the world. Listen to this. We, we think we take the gospel to the world so that we can make bad people good. Sounds good, but it's not right. We take the gospel to the world so we can make dead people alive. Did you hear me? You were once dead in your trespasses and sin, but because the Spirit of God moved inside of you, He made you new, and He gave you life, and He made you alive. We don't take the gospel to try to make bad people good. We take the gospel to try to make dead people alive. Psalm 38, verse 4 says, For mine iniquities are gone over my head. In other words, he's describing what it feels like to be drowning in your own sin. Anyone ever felt that? I know that I have. I can relate to the psalmist. 
the weight of my own sin, not even taking into account yours or my wife's or my kids, but the weight of my own sin is too heavy for me to bear. I'm not capable of bearing the load of my own sin. But praise God, Jesus Christ is and was and always will be. Notice the sins of the world. We are surrounded, church, every day by men and women who are capable of doing absolutely anything. Did you hear me? We think sometimes, well, we see a news story and we're like, well, that's horrible, but thank the Lord I would never find myself doing something like that or in that situation. Come on. I'm, I'm reminded of Cain. First boy ever born. Wasn't long. Listen to this. He killed his own brother. Why? It's really silly when you think about it. Because he was jealous of his own brother. Thought, you know what? I'll fix it. I'll just kill him. Think about David. A man after God's own heart and all the things that he was guilty of. I think about Judas Iscariot, a man who spent three and a half years of his life wandering all around with Jesus in person, seeing the miracles and hearing the teaching. But yet deep down in his heart was disappointed with the promised Messiah. I thought, you know what, it wasn't what I was hoping for, so I'll just sell him off. I think about Simon Peter, who also spent three and a half years with Jesus, but fortunately for him, his heart was way different than Judas. But Peter, in a moment, said, I'll never turn my back on you. I'll always be. They're not going to kill you. They'll have to kill me before they kill you. And Jesus just looked at him and said, Peter, before morning time, you're going to deny me three times. You want a more modern example? I could list out many. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. It means he died for the sins of a Jeffrey Epstein. He died for the sins of an O.J. Simpson. He died for the sins of Osama bin Laden. I mean, I could go on and on listing people that Jesus did indeed die for. Did, did they accept him? Will they accept him? They're still up? I don't know. My command is to go and to tell. I don't know that I'll ever get to meet, you know, uh, Jeff, well, no, I won't meet Jeffrey Epstein. But I don't know I'll ever meet a O.J. Simpson, a Tiger Woods. But you know what I can do? I know their names, Hector. I can take those names to the throne of grace in prayer and say, God, send someone that can share with them the truth of Jesus Christ. Because I do know this. If they'll repent of their sins and invite Jesus Christ into their heart and lives, guess what? He keeps his promises. He'll save them from their sins. And we got to be cautious, church, that we don't start thinking, well, I'm just glad I'm not them. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You can fall. It's only by the grace and the mercy of God that you're where you're at today. This sin-depraved people of this world, they need to be reached. And I'll tell you this, they'll only be reached. Are you listening? They'll only be reached by a compassionate Christian soul lover. We need to have a real love for souls. They're not going to be reached by you getting up in their face and telling them how sorry they are. Your chances of reaching them go to about zero at that point. But when you say, you know what? Hey, I was once just like you, and I met a man who loved me in spite of my sin, and he loved me so much that he gave his life to save me from my sin. That message can not only save them, it can change the entire trajectory of their life. Thirdly, Jesus saw their destiny in a Christless eternity. Jesus could see the end from the beginning. Jesus knew that apart from him, they were going to end up in a place called hell. Some people are like, well, hell's not a real good subject in 2021. Sorry, but it's still real. Hell exists. Real people go to hell. It's no wonder that Jesus was moved with such compassion because Jesus doesn't want any 
human being to go to hell. Now, I've heard human beings tell other human beings, go to hell, but Jesus has never told one single individual to go there. Jesus Christ loved every human being so much that he was willing to suffer, to bleed, and to die so that human beings didn't have to. Christians need to grab a hold of Christ's vision. If we really believe in hell like we say we do, then why in the world are we not telling more men and women and children about the Savior? Christians ought to be the most concerned ones about people going to hell. I can tell you this. You listening? The people that are in hell, they're very concerned about people who are on their way there. We see that in the conversation in Luke 16, 27 and 28, when the rich man was in hell. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Guys, we need to have our spiritual eyes opened. There are people all around us who are headed to hell. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, will they die and go there without us having told them? And fourthly, he saw their hopelessness. These who Jesus looked at, they were without a shepherd. They had no guidance. They had no protection. They had no security. They had no future. They were helpless. They were hopeless. They were lost. And they were all alone. They did not have the blessing of the church and other saved people. They had no one to pray for them, no one to pray with them. They had no companionship. They had no peace. They had no joy. They had no rest. They had no real satisfaction in life. All of those things, the, the lost world knows nothing about them. The lost world, even those who are the haves, are frustrated wondering why the things that they have haven't filled that vacancy in their life. Our supreme duty as Christians is to tell people about Jesus, not our politics. Not how much we hate taxes. I mean, I could go on about those things, but that's not my supreme duty. My supreme duty as a child of God is to tell people that Jesus loves them. You say, well, I'm not sure how. Well, then just sing Jesus loves me to them. <laughs> You're like, oh, well, I don't want to do that. You might bring them to tears. <laughs> That'd be a step. Our hearts, guys, ought to be broken for a lost world that does not know Jesus. I'm fixing to be done, but I'm gonna, I want to give you something to think about. Because this church is, I'll tell you what, if this church deserves a pat on the back or a hand clap for anything, it is our love for foreign missions. We're a good foreign mission church. For a church our size, and Tim can attest to this, preacher can attest to it, for a church our size, we, we give a lot to the cause of foreign missions to take the gospel to people in other countries and other parts of the world. But I ask you, can we really care about the lost soul in Zambia when we don't care about the person living next to us? Can we really say we care about the lost souls of Uruguay when we don't care about the person who sits in the cubicle next to us at work? figured it might get this quiet. And I'm not judging you. I'm not standing here pointing my finger at you. I'm, I'm looking at myself this morning. I got a neighbor on one side. I'm assuming, assuming by some of the things I've seen, they, they may be Buddhist. Sweet people. Very sweet. I couldn't ask for a nicer neighbor. But you know what? They need Jesus. And the Lord may have moved me right there next to them so they could have someone to tell them. Can I really say I care about the people in Italy and France and Germany where we send missionaries if I won't go over there and tell them how much Jesus loves them? We should give to foreign missions. We should pray for our missionaries. But we also need to be on mission right where we're at. Tell that person you work with, tell that person you live next to, hey, 
Can you really care about souls overseas when you have souls in your own household who are on their way to hell and you're not telling them? You say, well, I don't want to be offensive. I'll tell you what would be much more offensive is to get to heaven and have them stand there and be condemned to an eternity in hell wondering, why in the world didn't you tell me? Let's get on mission. Let's, let's see souls and be concerned for them the way that Christ is. Aren't you glad this morning that he cared for yours? That someone else cared for your soul, invited you to church, or shared the gospel with you, or took you to Sunday school, or to vacation Bible school, or sent you to church camp. However it was you came to Christ, aren't you glad someone cared enough to pour into you? What are we doing to continue that message? Would you bow your heads with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Please know my heart this morning. It's not a heart of, of a judgmental attitude because I'm speaking to myself first. There's always, I don't, I don't care who the greatest soul winner in the church is, there's always more that we could do for the kingdom of God. My first concern today is if you're here in this building or you're watching online and you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, I ask you, would you open your heart right now in this moment and just pray this simple prayer. If you're saying, yes, I need to receive Jesus right now in the quietness of your own heart because Jesus can hear your thoughts. Just, just pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I know it. I've sinned against you and I need your forgiveness. I know that you died for me. I know that you were buried. I believe that you rose again. And I know that today you're seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for me. So Lord, I come to you this morning asking you to forgive me of my sins and to come into my heart and be the Lord and the Savior of my life. If you just prayed that prayer, whether in this building or watching online, right where you're at, it does not matter because he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's all-knowing, He's all-hearing, He's all-seeing. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it in your heart, the Bible says that you are now a child of God. Jesus Christ is your shepherd. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to come single you out, but every eye closed. If you prayed that prayer this morning, you're here in the building, would you slip your hand up right where you're seated so I can just pray for you this morning and rejoice with you? Is there anybody that would raise their hand and say, Pastor Roy, I prayed that prayer today. Would you pray for me? I can't see online if you're watching online, just lift your hand to Jesus. We're here for you. We want to be an encouragement to you. Maybe Christian, I hadn't been taking that message. There's a lot of other messages I'm spreading, but it's not that one. And I believe that the Lord has spoke to us today, and I just hope and pray that we'll respond to him. If that's you, would you make a commitment today, Lord, I'm going to spend more time praying for souls who need to be saved. I'm going to spend more time putting feet to my prayers and trying to reach those who are around me. If you would say that this morning, would you raise your hand? Hands all over. Let's stand together. Stand together. I'm going to ask Brother Landon to sing. We're going to have a word of invitation. I'm just going to ask you to come and talk to God, do business with the Lord. However he spoke to you, this altar is open. Would you please come as we sing right now? Heart, oh Change my heart, oh God. People are coming. Maybe you're sitting there and you want to. Don't worry about the person next to you. Just come and talk to God. Maybe there's someone on your heart you need to be praying for right now. Lord, use me to reach that person. Would you pray for him today? Change my heart, oh God. Yeah.
This is what I praise. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. if you're watching online or if you're sitting in the auditorium and you've prayed that prayer and asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, we've got some pamphlets on the back table back here on the way out. We'd like you to pick one up. It's got a video of Roy kind of explaining about what happens. 1969, November the 16th, I, I was sitting in a jail cell in Houston, Texas, and I invited Jesus Christ into my heart. He took my life and he changed me. That's what salvation is about. It's giving Jesus Christ your life. And once you give him your life, you belong to him. And it's a growth process from that day forward. We want to help you. That's what Central Baptist Church exists for, is to help people on that spiritual journey. Giving your life to Jesus Christ and then he'll take you as far as you'll let him go in your life. Hello, Roy. Come on, Diane. Okay. Don't slip. No, turn and sit right there. All right. This is Diamond. And back during our uh, discipleship program on Wednesday nights, Diamond invited Jesus Christ into her heart and life and presented herself for believers' baptism. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So, Diamond, I want to ask you this morning, have you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart? And do you understand today the scriptural reason for your baptism? Based upon your public profession of faith, it is my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, bearing the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. You know, a lot of people think that that's what you have to do to get saved, is you've got to get baptized. Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism doesn't wash your sin away. You come to Jesus Christ and you humble yourself and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart. He shed his blood on Calvary's cross to wash away your sin. Once you give Jesus Christ your life, Baptism is your identification with Jesus Christ. It's telling the world, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. It's kind of like this thing on my finger right here called a wedding band. When I, Debbie and I got married, she put that ring on my finger. She didn't put that ring on my finger in order for us to be married. She put that ring on my finger as a sign to the world that I made a commitment. Baptism is simply telling the world, I made a commitment to Jesus Christ. We love you, pray for you. If you've made that decision, pick up a, one of those pamphlets in the back. If you need to talk with somebody, please stick around. We'd love to talk to you about the Lord Jesus. Love you and thank you.